Welcome to the respiratory system, the respiratory zone. Today's tutorial will focus on the histology of the respiratory zone. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the histology wizard. External respiration, or the movement of oxygen from the lungs to the blood and of carbon dioxide from the blood to the lungs, takes place in the respiratory zone. Deep in the lungs, the terminal branches of the bronchioles, called the terminal bronchioles, subdivide into two or more respiratory bronchioles at what is called the transition zone. Here the conduction part of respiration ends and gas exchange begins. Distal to the respiratory bronchioles are the alveolar ducts which end in air sacs called the alveoli. And alveoli are bunched together into clusters to form alveolar sacs. Gas exchange occurs on the surface of each alveolus by a network of capillaries carrying blood that has come through veins from other parts of the body. The pulmonary acinus is the unit of gas exchange in the lung, which is supplied by the respiratory bronchial and contains the alveolar duct, alveolar sacs, and the alveolus, the main site for gas exchange. Here is an H&E stain section of lung tissue showing these structures beginning with the respiratory bronchial, which is the first structure of the respiratory zone. The mucosa of the respiratory bronchial resembles that of the terminal bronchial, with simple cuboidal epithelium that has a few openings to alveoli where gas exchange occurs. These openings have low epithelium, which we will discuss in a few minutes. Smooth muscle and elastic connective tissue comprise the lamina propria. In this histological section stained with orsin, you can see the dark blue elastic fibers surrounding the pink smooth muscle fibers. Also present along the duct wall are smooth muscle knobs that bulge into the lumen. Moving distally along the respiratory bronchial, the openings to alveoli become more and more numerous and closer together. At the distal ends, the bronchioles branch into tubes called alveolar ducts. These ducts are completely lined with alveoli. The alveolar duct is lined with low or simple epithelium. In the thin lamina propria, a strand of smooth muscle cells surrounds the opening to the alveolus, and there is a network of supporting elastic and collagen fibers. Again, also present along the duct wall, are smooth muscle knobs that bulge into the lumen, now lined with alveolar epithelium. Large clusters of alveoli, called alveolar sacs, form the ends of alveolar ducts and occur occasionally along their length. The lamina propria is now quite thin, consisting of a web of elastic and reticular collagen fibers that closely surrounds each alveolus. A network of capillaries also surrounds each alveolus. Alveoli, the terminal part of the respiratory zone, are sac-like evaginations from the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and sacs. Each adult has roughly 300 million per lung, for a total surface area of around 75 meters squared. Air in these structures exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide with the blood and surrounding capillaries through specialized walls that enhance diffusion. If we look more closely at the structure of an alveolus, we can see that they are essentially thin-walled sacs. Neighboring alveoli are separated by interalveolar septa that consists of scattered fibroblast cells and some extracellular matrix, mostly elastic and reticular collagen fibers. The arrangement of elastic fibers allows the alveoli to expand and contract passively with expiration, while the reticular fibers prevent collapse and extensive distension. Think of a chicken wire frame that holds the basic shape together, but allows for some flexibility. These septa are vascularized with capillary networks that are also supported by the meshwork of fibers in the alveolar walls. The alveolar pores, or pores of cone, penetrate the septa and connect neighboring alveoli that are connected to different bronchioles. This helps to equalize air pressure, helps when bronchioles are blocked, and allows macrophages to travel freely. However, they also allow the rapid spread of bacteria or neoplasms within the alveoli. Let's take a closer look at the histology of the alveolus. Capillary endothelial cells of the alveolar walls are very thin, continuous capillaries. The alveolar epithelium has two cell types, type 1 and type 2 alveolar cells, also called pneumocytes. The type 1 alveolar cell represents about 95% of the cell surface, but these are extremely thin, flattened cells that are joined by tight junctions that prevent leakage of tissue fluid into the alveolar airspace. The type 2 alveolar cells are predominantly located at the angles formed by adjacent alveolar septa. 
These cells are larger, cuboidal, and are vacuolated. These cells function as the primary stem cells of the alveolus. When the alveolar epithelium is damaged, type 2 cells proliferate and repair the damage. Although it was long thought that type 2 cells were the only cells capable of repairing the epithelium, we now know that club cells in terminal bronchioles also have a reparative function, and it was more recently discovered that under certain conditions, type 1 cells can also serve as stem cells. The cytoplasm of type 2 cells contains lamellar bodies that have secretory granules containing pulmonary surfactant. Surfactant is released by exocytosis and spreads over a thin layer of fluid to coat the alveolar surface. You can easily see the lamellar bodies containing surfactant in the type 2 alveolar cells shown in this H&E stain section. What is surfactant? Surfactant is a detergent type lipid that functions to reduce surface tension at the air fluid interface. This reduces the tendency for alveoli to collapse at the end of expiration. With surfactant, attractive forces at the surface are disrupted, thus reducing surface tension, but when surfactant is lacking, the molecules are attracted to one another and are pulled together. Another cell found in the septa and in the alveoli is the alveolar macrophage, or dust cell. These cells phagocytose erythrocytes lost from damaged capillaries and inhaled particulates that make it to the alveoli, as well as facilitating turnover of surfactant. Although they are similar in size and shape to type 2 alveolar cells, they can be distinguished because they are slightly darker due to content of dust and complexed iron, called hemosiderin, from erythrocytes. Here are two examples of dust cells in an H&E stain section. The image on the left is more characteristic of smoker's lungs. Some of these cells migrate into bronchioles and exit the lung via the mucociliary escalator, some exit in lymphatics, and some stay in the lungs for years. Now that we've discussed the cells that comprise the alveoli, we will examine how these cells contribute to the blood-air barrier. The respiratory membrane or blood-air barrier allows for gas exchange. Air in the alveolus exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide with the blood in surrounding capillaries through thin, specialized alveolar walls that enhance diffusion between the internal and external environment. Air in the alveoli is separated from the capillary blood by three components. The cytoplasm of the capillary endothelial cell shown here in red, the cytoplasm of the type 1 alveolar cell shown here in orange, and the fused basal lamina of the capillary endothelial cell and the type 1 alveolar cell. In this inset, you can appreciate how closely opposed these cells are and just how thin this barrier is. Gas exchange in the alveoli is thus accomplished by oxygen from the alveolar air diffusing through the blood-air barrier into the capillary blood, where it binds hemoglobin in erythrocytes. Carbon dioxide diffuses into alveolar air from the pulmonary blood. All right, we've made it through the respiratory zone. Be sure to check out the video on the conducting zone. Thanks for stopping by.